Welcome to my talk um, about Java in-memory apps with MicroStream. My name is Florian Habermann and one, I'm one of the co-founders of the company. And um, today I will show you what's MicroStream all about and how to use it and get started with our new framework. So first of all, the safe harbor statement we have to show. And the contents of my talk for today are the rationale, what's the idea behind MicroStream, where did the idea come from, where, uh, what did we want to change, and uh, that's the road uh, of the idea behind the framework. And then we'll dive right into it, how to install MicroStream, um, to start it up, to configure it uh, in different ways how to load data, and uh, we'll see the difference between eager and lazy loading. Um, of course, how to store data back to the persistent layer. Um, and at the end, we, we will have a look at some kind of customization, custom type handlers, uh, or the type mapping or evolution in classes over the life cycle of applications and some kind of configuration for the backup and housekeeping. And what's uh, that all about, or a, a deeper look into the frameworks um, belly. So um, what's the status quo of, of the database development, or if you want to put a persistent layer to your Java application right now is, um, of course, you have your, your Java application with your Java object graph, which lies in, in memory, and somewhere else in a different process, you have a database of some sort, uh, one of the modern ones, NoSQL data stores, the older relational data stores, or you can use event streaming um, in memory databases or data grids. So there are, there are several um, ways to store data nowadays. Um, but all of these approaches share um, the same um, problems. First of all, um, there are two different data models needed. The one data model, uh, Java, Developer always uses, of course, his class design, his Java classes, which defines the, the object graph later on. And on the other hand, you have the data structure of the database. So you have tables, um, key values, documents, and whatnot. So um, you need, uh, in order to combine these two worlds of the Java object graph, the Java application, and the external data storage, you have to uh, adapt your Java classes effortly. It's strongly limited, of course. Um, the flat, uh, the resulting Java object model is kind of a flat Java object model. You can't leverage all the possibilities you've got um, with uh, the powerful Java APIs, which are around. And of course, in order to convert the data for them back, you need a highly complex mapping framework. The most commonly used ones, of course, are object relational mappings uh, over JPA like Habernate um, for relational tables and a lot more, but they all sh uh, share the same shortcomings and complexity levels. So it leads to a tremendous loss of performance um, most cases, you need an additional uh, caching framework, and all about it. it's becoming a, a real complex architecture just to persist data for an application. Um, on top of that, to query your data, you must utilize a query language or a Java query API for that. That's an infamous source of error. It's hard to debug, and you need, um, of course, experienced um, JPA or, or NoSQL specialists, um, it's a high effort and um, a costly approach to store data if you use one of the enterprise databases, of course. And um, you know, high effort development process and, of course, maintenance. So, And 
there was the idea born uh, to change the way of developing or to store data because uh, what the idea behind microstream is to put the application um, as a first class citizen and um, to make the application the source of truth so uh, microstream itself it's a, a unique storage technology that stores the Java object graphs natively, which means similar as they are in the RAM. Um, and that comes without an expensive transformation to any incompatible data structure. And that's a key difference to all database system uh, and provides you fantastic benefits. It feels like a, a native Java function for storing data. Only one data structure is needed. That's the object graph and only one data model, of course, each of our classes. So you have no more impedance mismatch, no more mapping, and no more loss of performance through it, um, which makes the pure Java in-memory computing paradigm possible. And you can max out the ultra-fast in-memory computing power of the JVM. It's a simple architecture. It's super easy to use and simplifies and accelerates your entire database development process. Um, and the new paradigm here, the source of truth is now the application and not your database anymore. The application is in full control of everything and not dependent of an external storage service. So you design your object graph in your application, the database itself or your, your object graph itself can be viewed as the database and Microstream is used as a persistent layer which stores the um, data to a um, storage target of your choice. Um, basically, you can use everything as a storage target which takes bytes or blobs. Most of the time, it will be the local file system, or you can use um, uh, cloud storages like AWS S3, or you can put your data blocks into event streaming um, platforms like Kafka. Uh, distributed caches and so on. So we have um, um, adapters for basically everything which takes bytes. And if you need um, an adapter to different system, uh, you can implement it as well. So what's MicroStream technically? Um, it's not an, a third party server but it, it's uh, a tiny Java library which runs inside of your application and is available in Maven Central. Just use your build management tool of your choice and add, uh, add it to your class path. So here we see the simplest example um, which will create a new storage if no existing storage is found. And if an existing storage is there, it just will be loaded. So you see the embedded storage manager, um, which is started up and shut down. And that's the whole life cycle of the MicroStream API, MicroStream management threads. And the embedded storage manager can be seen as a connection between your object graph and the storage layer or the, the, the persistent layer of your application. So um, the embedded storage manager is mostly created with factory methods of the embedded storage type um, where the most common settings lie or most common parameters could be handed over, um, like the location of your uh, storage, in this case, a, a local storage path, and the root object of your entity graph. Um, if the storage detects um, an existing storage at the startup, the root object will be populated out of this uh, data and the object graph becomes alive automatically at the startup. And everything which is loaded eagerly will be put into the RAM and the lazy loaded stuff, which I'll show you later on, can be loaded on demand. So 
just hand over the root pointer um, where your persistent object graph begins and um, microstream will take care of the ego loading. Otherwise, um, the root just will be left as is if no storage is there. So to achieve a more uh, detailed customization, you can utilize the foundations. In this case, because we're using the storage API, we have an embedded storage foundation. It's kind of a factory type. It holds and creates on demand all parts that form an embedded storage manager. Some builder pattern style configuration foundation where all aspects of the storage engine can be customized. And this is the most low level configuration style. Microstream is a uh, heavily customizable API. It's strictly interface based. And every single aspect of the engine can be customized or exchanged or tailored to your needs. Um, you can see we have a storage configuration with a channel comp provider. The channel is basically an IO channel. Um, which runs in parallel to, to speed up the I.O. process. Um, we set a backup, a continuous backup for the storage. Um, and from this foundation, we can create a storage manager again and start up the storage. On higher level, a property-based configuration API uh, can be found uh, in this dependency, Microsoft storage and better configuration, and it supports external configuration sources as well. So here we have a convenience layer for config purposes, um, as well as facilities to read external configuration. So the configuration type consolidates the most widely used parameters from the storage foundations in one place. And its output again is a storage foundation from which embedded storage manager can be created again. Um, so we have a simple setter API with the most used um, properties. And um, from there, you're good to go to create a storage manager again. And based on this API, um, we can read external configurations. For uh, example, um, XML, any YAML, and JSON files are supported. And it's a, a good use for profiles, of course, like dev, test, and production. And uh, this one is based on, a, on our general purpose configuration layer, um, which is used. Um, in different framework integrations as well. Um, we have uh, Spring Boot, Heliton, and Micronaut right now. So uh, Microstream can read its configuration from the frameworks configuration, the application YAML from Spring Boot, for example. And therefore, you don't have to configure Microstream in a different place, just use your framework, uh, framework's configuration layer as you used to, and Microstream is happy to uh, read its properties out there. So how is the, the loading done? It can be done in two ways, eagerly and lazily. The, the basic default way of loading um, is eager loading, meaning uh, all object of the stored object graph are loaded immediately at startup. And of course, only if an existing database is found. So we can say we start up a storage with default configuration. And then we say, is our root now? If it is so, um, we initialize a default root with our default values for our database, store it. And from now on, we can access the root object and work with it um, in a normal Java way. So that raises, of course, the question, is my database size limited to my RAM size? Uh, no, it isn't. Because you can leverage the lazy loading functionality. 
um, licenses this example. So let's say we have a business app, which has uh, business years with the, uh, the year as a key and the business year itself as a value and the business year contains the whole turnovers. And let's say uh, we have uh, turnovers for 20 business years, approximately 1 million sales, makes 20 million entities, and you pump it directly into the RAM and startup, and you only have uh, 2 gig of RAMs, it probably won't work. So um, we won't accept it that way. Um, so, um, and we didn't partition our model just to load everything anyway. Um, so it would be nice if we could simply add a lazy to the turnover list because we only want to load uh, the current business years turnovers because it's the hot data and the the past years turnovers is only loaded on demand for um, statistics stuff like that. And so, how do we add lazy to our object model? So basically. That's all you have to do, just wrap it in uh, our lazy type. And from now on, all the the complete subgraph from this lazy reference on will be loaded lazily on demand and can be unloaded on demand to free memory again. It is um, accessed with a simple getter. Um, <clears throat> it's just a, um, a reference intermediate type um, in general. And the get method call reloads the data as needed if it's not in memory uh, already. And by doing so, of course, you don't have to mess around with uh, with uh, query, for example, select uh, stuff from turnovers where ID is or not. This is all done by Microsteam in the background. Microsteam knows where its references uh, and subgraphs are located in the storage and just loads this partial subgraph again into memory and uh, populates the object. And that's all you have to do. Just call a simple getter and your data will be there at your fingertips. So um, the, this is possible because of an internal automatic object ID mapping. mapping. It's called swizzling. So uh, you don't need to worry about the technical auto-generated unique IDs um, in object model, like with uh, GPA applications. Microstream manages that in the background in its object registry. Um, of course, you can useful IDs, which are relevant in the real world, um, like uh, ISBNs or uh, customer IDs, which are used in invoices. But these are part of the business model, not technically low-level IDs. No more auto-generated keys. So we see we have a wrapper type which wraps the part of the object graph which should be loaded lazily. Um, the lazy dot reference factory method creates a new uh, lazy reference, and the getter will access it and load the data again. So the, <clears throat> the question always is. Um, why don't you use uh, annotations for that? Um, we could have used um, an add lazy, for example. It would be less noisy, of course, in your in your code. Um, but there are technical reasons why we couldn't do that. Uh, if it were just that, it would be bare Java bytecode for accessing an error list. In that case. And there would be no way for a middleware library like Microstream to get access and look it up and perhaps reload it. What's written there is an array list reference. There is no lazy anymore. Either the instance is null or it is not. If you wanted to reach in there, you would have to start with bytecode manipulations. Like manipulation, um, it's technically possible, but something we really didn't want to do um, and fiddle with the application. So there must always be some form of intermediary type, like our lazy wrapper here. Hibernate, for example, solves this uh, through its own collections um, that do lazy loading internally. 
Um, although the lazy loading is nicely hidden in some way, it also comes with all sort of limitations. You can only use interfaces instead of concrete classes for collections. Um, at first, the instance is not the one you dictate. The code becomes intransparent and difficult to debug and so on and so on. You want to be able to write anything you want and uh, you want full insight and control, debuggability, for example, over your code. And all of this can be achieved with uh, the tiny lazy interim reference class, which has no restrictions, no incomprehensible magic under the hood, like proxy instances and stuff, and is also usable for individual instances. All right. So, <clears throat> uh, that lazy aspect is an internal technical detail of the business here. Um, we don't want the caller to see that, of course. So we hide that away in the getters and setters, for example, just to be sure we have to null check it, of course. But there's a util method for that. So you see the turnovers is a, a field which is hidden itself. Is lazy, but the getters will return just the list without the lazy aspect. And of course, we have to check if the turnover uh, reference is null, then we have to return null elsewhere. Otherwise, the turnover's content. But that's a bit noisy to write, so uh, we have a utility method for so just say lazy get, hand over the reference, and it will do the null check internally. And in complete, it will look like this. The getter just returns the contents of the lazy, the list of turnovers, and the setter will create a new lazy reference for the turnovers. And that's just one of many possibilities how to hide the lazy from the caller as an internal aspect of your class design. So, um, there are several more methods of uh, the lazy, which are interesting. Of course, the getter, which will load the contents on demand. The lazy peak will return the current state, which is either the loaded reference or null, if it's loaded, but it won't trigger the loading in the background. And you can clear out the lazy reference again, meaning it's removed from uh, your RAM, from your heap, but um, the state of the object graph of the subgraph is still kept in in a storage by microstream and can be restored anytime and all lazy references track the time of their last access creation or querying as a timestamp and if an instance is deemed timed out by a, our lazy reference manager <clears throat> its subject gets cleared so the lazy reference manager uses a lazy checker, which is basically a predicate when a lazy reference can be cleared. And the default one works with a timeout and a memory quota. Um, and that's how Microsoft keeps the hot data in memory and clears the cold data by default, which should be sufficient in most cases. So the lazy reference ma manager is started automatically. Um, if you start up an embedded storage manager and it will keep uh, your memory from uh, overflowing by clearing up uh, outdated or least used lazy references out of the memory and this is done by default so you don't have to worry uh, about overflowing your ram because the lazy reference manager will take care of that so how to store data First of all, um, the root reference, which can be assigned to the embedded storage manager, it's uh, the, the entrance of the uh, persistent object graph. It can be stored with a store root method. If you change a single object, like uh, set to the name of a customer, just store this customer. And if you add, if you add an item to a collection, just store the collection. So store the modified object is key. Um, if you add a new item to the list, the list becomes the modified object in that case. The item is new. The referent is the list and the list gets changed by adding an item. So you have to store the list, of course. <clears throat> Microstream itself does not provide explicit transactions. 
every call to a store method is automatically a transaction within. And the store operation is an automatically all or nothing operation. And if the store call is successful, all data is written to the storage. Um, otherwise, no data is persisted, partially persisted, data will be reverted. And of course, you can put multiple modifications into a, a single store call, change the customer, change the list, and store both. And they are written inside uh, in, um, in a transaction within the store call. These store methods are sufficient most of the time, but you can open a, a storage transaction by yourself. Just uh, create a storer, a lazy one or an eager one. <coughs> call store for several uh, types and call commit at the end. And this code you see here is basically what a embedded storage manager dot store call does internally. It opens a storer, it stores the reference to or registers the objects to the storer and by committing they are getting persisted. So the default mode is lazy storing mode and in eager storing mode referenced instances are stored even if they have been stored before. Contrary to the lazy, um, this will also store modified child objects at cost of performance of course. So basically every object, object which is reachable from this reference will be stored again. The lazy storer will only store the given objects which you hand over to the store method and new objects which are referenced by um, this one. Um, and if you're not sure what to use, if uh, um, if you want to go save to store all data, use an eager storer. And if you know what objects have changed, a lazy storer is uh, sufficient. So on the other hand, you can customize um, the eager storing. For example, we, want, uh, we have a class containing items and every time this class uh, is stored, the containing items should be stored as well. Um, so for that, we, um, we could design a, a eager annotation, put it on top of our uh, fields which should be stored eager. And the uh, predicate uh, we, we have to provide to the engine is a persistence eager storing field evaluator. Basically, if this one returns true for a certain field in a class, it's stored eagerly all the time. In our case, we check for the eager annotation. And this one liner is all you have to do and hand it over to the uh, foundation types as a custom field evaluator. And then you can customize what fields are stored eagerly. So to wrap up, um, if you use the storage minus store method, which by default is lazy, the eager storing field evaluator will be asked. Or if you use an eager storer, the objects or the, the complete subgraph will be stored anyway. So um, you can leave out parts of your classes from the persistent layer um, done by transcend field by default. So we can exclude fields from the persistence, for example, temporary flags, computed fields, stuff like that. By default, the transcend keyword um, is used for that, but you can customize it as well. By persistence field evaluator, in that case, a predicate again, um, which returns is if a, a field should be stored and uh, you can use prefix matching um, or, or name patterns or whatever you like, or use annotations again um, to customize what fields should be left out by Microstream. So now we've seen how easy it is to load and store data and how to customize it. How about deleting data? If you think about deleting data, um, 
Microsim um, doesn't have rows in tables which can be deleted, so there is no delete command per se. Um, just think pure Java, uh, like every time with Microstream, we have a pure Java application, and how do you delete data from your object graph? You have to remove all references to a certain object to hand it over to the garbage collector and uh, remove it. So, um, in that case, we want to delete an item from a list. We will remove it. And then we store the modified object, which is the list again. And then if there are no, no more references to that specific item in the object graph, it will be eventually deleted from, from your storage. Um, and deleting data, of course, does not require performing explicit deleting actions, like a delete from table where some condition is met. Instead, you just need to clear the references and store these changes like it's done here. If a stored object is not reachable anymore, its data will be deleted then from the storage layer by our garbage collector. Um, you can uh, compare it to the Java garbage collector, but uh, our um, garbage collector works on a persistent layer and erases all dereferenced objects from the storage uh, eventually. So, um, deleted data is not erased immediately after the storage call um, from the stored files, but um, the erasing from the storage files is done by the housekeeping process, which I will show you later what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and the housekeeping process takes care of um, cleaning up the storage, old data, deleted data, and, and, and so on. Um, to keep your storage at the uh, maximum needed size, byte-wise. So, and that's basically all the CRUD operations you need to do with Microstream. You, the loading is done automatically at startup or lazily on demand. To store objects is just a simple method call and uh, deleting is basically storing the modified reference or refer referencing objects um, and the uh, removed item will be will vanish from the storage eventually. And that's about it with Microstream. So <clears throat> a little customizing. Um, for example, custom type handler. So what, what is a type handler? Microstream's basically or Microstream is based on a tailor-made serialization engine. So serializer, of course, um, takes care of putting Java object state into binary form and back. And we'll need that to create a persistent state for your object graph and, and restore it at any time. And um, we could have used, for, of course, um, the default Java serialization or, or different other serializers which are on the market. But uh, they had um, a lot of shortcomings, which uh, made it impossible for us to put or to create a storage manager on top of that. For example, the, the security issues um, for most um, serializers at uh, deserialization, which execute code, and that's a, a big security risk. And you can't restore partial subgraphs of the complete object graphs and merge it into existing graphs. And um, you mostly you have to um, adapt your, your models to the serialization engine. You have to write code regarding the serializer into your object model um, to customize it. And um, the sum of these problems uh, made us decide to develop a serializer from scratch. And um, that's the base of, uh, of all our products and the storage engine. And um, <clears throat> the type handler, um, in our case, is, um, is used to, uh, uh, describes how a class is converted to binary form and back. So um, it uh, is an external configuration type. So um, you don't have to pollute your 
uh, your business model with uh, technical stuff. Um, and you can, since it's an external handler, you can customize third party types as well. So um, if you you don't access to, to the source code for Apache collections uh, or whatnot, you can't just uh, modify your your collection types, but you can write a custom type handler for that anyway because it is an external configuration. So you take the control over the storing and loading procedure over the specific types, and you can, of course, optimize performance and memory consumption. <clears throat> um, so um, you have to ask yourself, uh, the question raises every time, um, do I have to write my custom type handlers for everything? Uh, don't worry, we bring type handlers for well, specialized type handlers, optimized type handlers for the most common use types in a JDK, the, the collections, uh, dates, and um, and several other types. And for user-defined classes or classes where, where no special handler is present, we generate generic ones. So the generic ones uh, analyze the types by reflection and um, decide how it's the best and the most efficient way to convert the objects to binary form without breaking the referential integri uh, integrity and back. So the shortcoming of the generic approach, of course, it is a bit verbose. So let's take a, an example. We have a, a time slot type with a slot number, um, a start and an end date. So MicroStream sees this one as three different references, three different objects which they are in memory. Of course, you have a time slot instance and you have two date instances. So for every instance, one single record is written into the storage. Basically what the generic handler is, it breaks up the object into primitives and references. And each reference, like the second date here, is referenced by an internally generated object ID, which can be used to refer reference it later on. And then, um, the timestamp of the later date, which is all the data it has internally, uh, is stored as a primitive again. So we have two records for this simple um, data entry, if you will. So, so <clears throat> and if you have a lot of time slots in a database, um, you want to optimize that and store the three instances in one record in a, in a storage where the slot number is stored and timestamp of the two dates directly. And if you load the stuff again, you can create the local dates out of the um, timestamps again. So it uses about a third, third of the storage and it, it is much more efficient and uh, space efficient. Yeah. <clears throat> and we have different APIs to provide uh, custom type handlers. Um, the first one would be um, a builder pattern where you say I want a binary type handler for the time slot type and then several binary fields with a, uh, a storer and a loader handler for each field. So the so slot number is written and the slot number is set. And that's about it. For example, with the local date or, or date type here. Um, so you can put your type handler directly into your time slot clause. Um, a static method which returns a binary type handler instance at MicroStream will use it automatically as a type handler for this type with, without uh, registering anything at the configuration phase. But of course, this is only possible if you um, own the source of the type and if you don't own the source, you have to register an external handler, of course. One example for that would be, for example, if we want a uh, uh, register custom buffered image handler for the buffered image type in a JDK. And we want, we want to store it as a, a PNG encoded image. We uh, just extend one of the type handler base types and we convert the buffered image to a PNG and store it and uh, vice versa, it is loaded. So with this, where you can customize your type handlers. 
And one of um, another important um, thing is uh, what about changing types? Your classes will um, change over the life cycle of your application, and uh, of course, you can handle these changes with uh, within MicroStream. So you have, um, for example, a contact which changes uh, name and first name, get to first name and last name. Fields get renamed, moved, um, added, and so on. So this can be handled. So if you type, uh, if MicroStream takes a type mapping or a, a change type, it will, the console will look like this. And um, therefore, um, will apply um, um, an auto detected change by an uh, algorithm where which is making best guess what field should be assigned or, or renamed. Um, but if you want to um, to supply a, a custom type mapping where you can make sure to make the right mapping, um, just provide a simple um, CSV or XML file or whatever you will use. So if this is the old one, this is a new one. You can rename classes, uh, move it through different packages, rename fields and so on. And then the um, the legacy type mapper will um, read the old data set out of your storage and map it, map, it, uh, map it to the new type. And this can be done several times. So you don't have to worry uh, about several type changes because MicroStream will see it as a different type at every change, apply the mapping accordingly. And so the data can be uh, used with um, evolving classes through the application's lifecycle. So at the end, uh, we'll show a few more configuration stuff like the backup. At the beginning, we saw the, if you set the backup directory, this will initialize a continuous backup, which will be populated uh, through the runtime of the application. Or if you want to write a, a full backup of your database, just call the issue full backup method and hand over the location where it should be written. And then a complete backup of your database will be um, written to the even a different file system or a different storage target. And last but not least, what, what's the housekeeping, the mentioned housekeeping all about? Um, MicroStream uses uh, append writes to the storage, so it never overwrites existing data. And uh, this has um, uh, stuff. Uh, this means um, if uh, if you store objects multiple times, you change ob objects multiple times, and the records uh, will be written at the end of the file. Then um, old uh, data will uh, come up in a storage, and um, so um, unused bytes will emerge in files, and that's what the housekeeping will take care, about, care of. It will um, remove all the records which um, which gets uh, unused, remove it from the storage, and the, the unreachable objects which are marked by our garbage collector will be removed from the storage. And this creates defragmented uh, storage files, um, which the housekeeping takes care of as well. Um, and um, so the file will be defragmented and, and cleaned up. So <clears throat> it will remove the old data and the de defragmentation, the internally used cache will be cleaned up by the housekeeping and the garbage collector, which detects unreachable objects will be re removed from the storage as well. So the housekeeping can be customized as well. You can um, define an interval which the housekeeping should be should take place, and the time budget it gets. For most applications, a the default configurations will be configuration will be sufficient. But if you 
have a, a more write heavy application, um, you should consider uh, increasing the budget. In uh, one of the upcoming versions, <clears throat> most probably 7.2, we will bring an adaptive housekeeping controller, which will increase the needed budget uh, on demand if the garbage collector um, doesn't have enough time to clean up the storage, um, the adaptive controller will increase it from time to time to get your storage clean. <clears throat> and you can call the housekeeping processes uh, directly by calling the methods of the embedded storage manager as well. So the file check, garbage collection and so on. All right. <clears throat> So this was a, a short overview of the Microsystem Storage Engine, how to get started, um, um, use cloud operation and customize uh, stuff. If you want further reading, of course, go to our documentation on <clears throat> and all links and resources, example projects, um, and uh, much more can be found, of course, on our GitHub page. Um, there's also our open source repositories and Thank you for for listening. <clears throat> Have uh, fun at the check on this year, and see you sometime. Thank you.